Okay, well, my name is Andrea O.K. Wright, and I also go by just A.O.K., which are my first three initials. And I'm going to talk about building games with Ruby. I'm going to start off by talking about libraries geared toward 2D game development. Then we'll move on to 3D game development. And I'll conclude by discussing whether playing games written in Ruby can be as much fun as writing them. Or do they just run too slowly with too many breaks in the action at inopportune times? This is not a tutorial on how to use any particular library, but I do hope to give you an idea of what the different libraries have to offer and what distinguishes one from another. The first library I'm going to talk about is Ruby SDL, a Ruby extension for SDL by a developer who goes by Ohi. SDL stands for Simple Direct Media Layer. It's a cross-platform open source library that provides multimedia support. Like most of the libraries I'm going to talk about, it offers sound and video support. But for the most part, I'm only going to talk about graphics. SDL was developed in C. Making C library functions available to Ruby developers involves using the Ruby C API and wrapping the original C function in ways that account for differences between the two languages. In some cases, the original C doesn't require much in the way of special handling to be callable from the Ruby side, like SDL get ticks, which returns how long the program has been running in milliseconds. Here's that C method signature from the original SDL library. And here in the bottom box is the Ruby SDL extension wrapper for SDL get ticks. The uint to num macro is used to convert the C return type to a Ruby num for consumption from a Ruby caller. Also notice that even though the C function doesn't take any arguments, the corresponding wrapper takes one parameter. Not being object oriented, C wouldn't know what to call the function on if it wasn't passed in. The wrapper also needs to be referenced in the extensions init method in order to be callable from the Ruby side. So here's how the wrapper is referenced in Ruby SDL's initialization code. The RB defined module function maps the C extension code to a corresponding method name the Ruby programmer can use, in this case, get ticks. For people who prefer the Ruby style method names with underscores, OHI provides an alias since you can't pass multiple Ruby method names to the RB defined module function. Here are four of the sample apps that are packaged with SDL. They're pretty basic, but they represent a good chunk of functionality that you would need to create a wide variety of more complex games if you put them all together. The red shapes are set to move randomly, except for the one in the middle and the one up here in, in the upper corner, which it's, it's wired to move up or down or side to side, depending on which key you press. The uh, one down here in the lower, in the lower corner, um, the one that's sort of gray, um, represents the collision detection and handling. When two red shapes collide, they're programmed to bounce off each other and change direction. I thought SDL would be a good library to start with because it's the lowest level library I'm going to be covering, and it would give me an opportunity to go over game development concepts that apply to all the other frameworks. We can look at some of these common functions right in the code sample apps that are packaged with Ruby SDL. A number of these functions are encapsulated in the framework code for the other libraries. Basically, I'll be progressing through the libraries from lowest level to higher level. The set video mode method must be called for every Ruby SDL app. It creates the display surface that the images will appear on. You can pass it a flag to specify which rendering system to use, SW or software surface, an HW or hardware surface, or OpenGL. It's usually best to avoid hardware surface. Forcing hardware acceleration doesn't always improve performance. Not all video drivers are optimized in a way that complements SDL games, and also hardware acceleration is not an option on all platforms. As for OpenGL, it's probably the fastest option, but it's not very well integrated with Ruby SDL. You'd need to use OpenGL, the OpenGL API for drawing, which is not hard to understand, but it can be somewhat cumbersome. We'll look at the OpenGL API a little while later. Now we'll take a closer look at the app with one controllable shape. As, you, as you'll see when we look at the source, you can't move it all around the screen. It gets sent back to the center of the screen at the beginning of each frame. I think you'll agree that the code is very easy to follow. Here's the code that creates all the red shapes. Sprite is the class that's responsible for the ones that move about randomly, and movable SP, short for movable sprite, is the class responsible for the shape in the middle. A sprites array is created to hold all the sprites. When I first got started um, with video game programming, I thought a sprite was a stock woodland elf in a fantasy game. I see it used in contexts like this SDL game and wonder if the sprites weren't supposed to represent elves dancing around. 
It turns out that sprite is a standard computer graphics term for a 2D object whose position typically changes between frames. Here's the code that sets up a game loop and event queue processor. The quit event is called when the user clicks on the apps button or the game window frame. So this event loop closes the app if the user hits the escape, hits escape or clicks on the X. In each frame, move is called on all the sprites and then draw. Then the screen is updated by virtue of the update rect call. This is a pattern that you'll see over and over. Sprites determine if and how they need to move or change their appearance. They're copied to the display surface and draw, and then the display gets updated to reflect the changes. Here's the definition of the random motion sprites. This is a pretty, com pretty complete definition of the class, but just to save space, I took out the Y code that corresponds with the X code. So in initialize, the sprite's initial X and Y coordinates are randomly set and dx and dy, which represent how much the sprite will move along the x-axis and y-axis for each frame, are also set randomly. The move method assigns values to the x and y coordinates by either adding the dx and dy values or subtracting them if the sprite has reached the edge of the screen. SDL blitz surface, called in draw, copies the image of the red shape to the display surface. Here's the class definition for the sprite in the middle. When move is called, it initializes both the up-down factor, the UD factor, and the LR, the left-right factor, to zero, and then sets the values of up-down and left-right depending on which arrow key was pressed, if any. In draw, the last two parameters represent the new X and Y coordinates for the sprite and are highlighted in red. When both factors are zero, the sprite is drawn at the center of the screen. Otherwise, the sprite moves 50 pixels or negative 50 pixels from the center in the specified direction. Now we'll look at an actual game that was written using Ruby SDL. Steven Davidowitz's Nebula Gauntlet is a great resource for learning about SDL techniques like scrolling the background and using a particle engine to simulate rocket fire. It's still a work in progress, but there's already a lot of features in place. I really like this little radar screen on the top that shows a miniature version of all the action that's going on. You can save games, and it comes with a map editor that lets you create your own maps in point-and-click fashion. With the map editor, you can specify where the shields and bots should be placed. Bots are programmed to chase your ship. You can see that um, that second ship there is a bot. Even though it has so many features, it's still structured exactly like the rudimentary sample games we just looked at. Here's the main event loop. It evaluates input, determines if the ship and other entities need to change their position, repositions them, and then updates the display on the screen. Here's the code that's responsible for the radar area. It loops through all the ships, bots, and shields, and scales a proportional model of the action by dividing the x and y coordinates of each object by the size modifier, which is set to 15 in the application initialization code. Then it draws a white circle to represent each one. And right, now we'll move on to Rudel. There hasn't been much active development on this project for a few years, but it's a good source of ideas, and it's packaged with some interesting resources. Rudel was created to provide a way to use SDL with more conventional Ruby syntax and more conventional Ruby style, and also to minimize the amount of boilerplate code you have to write, like initialization code. The Rudel display surface exemplifies Rudel's approach to meeting those goals. It's the Rudel wrapper for the CSDL library set video mode, which creates the display surface that all the images will appear on. Rudel creator, creator Danny Von Bruggen felt that it violated the principle of least surprise for a method that creates a new display surface and returns it to be called set video mode. He thought you would expect a display surface to be returned from something like you know, calling new on display surface. He also didn't think it was necessary to pass four parameters to it. The, last, the third parameter, um, which stands for bits per pixel, will usually be set to 16. And the last parameter, which represents the rendering engine, is likely to be set to software surface. So here's a sample Rudel call to the set video mode wrapper as compared to a sample Ruby SDL call to its set video mode wrapper, which is a very thin literal wrapper around the SDL C library set video mode. Here's the complete source for the Ruby SDL wrapper. As you can see, it's a very thin literal wrapper. And it does the minimum required to enable set video mode to be called from a Ruby app. Here's the corresponding Rudel wrapper. The ellipsis is a placeholder for the many things that happen in this wrapper, like evaluating which of the optional parameters were passed in and the pyrotechnics necessary to make the C extension wrapper behave like a constructor for the display surface class. Sometimes instead of putting a lot of 
code in the C extension files, developers create thin wrappers for the C library functions, and then write a pure Ruby library to make the API more elegant and add functionality. Here's that side-by-side -side comparison again. Arguably, it's less surprising for a call to display surface new to create and return a new display surface than a call to a method called set video mode. But there's also a case to be made for there being a sense in which the Ruby SDL wrapper is less surprising as an SDL wrapper. One advantage to a thinner, more literal wrapper is that they make it easier for users of the extension library to use the original documentation of the wrapped library. One of the very useful resources packaged with Rudel is a set of Ruby translations of the Neon Helium OpenGL tutorials. These, transla these transla translations use OpenGL as the rendering system, but they use Rudel for everything else, like event handling. While we're talking about Rudel, then, I want to show you the Open what the OpenGL API looks like. This code is from a sample that creates a couple of two-dimensional primitives. First, using OpenGL requires a fair amount of initialization code. And that's what we're looking at here. Here's the code that renders the triangle. Since OpenGL is a 3D rendering system, points are represented by vertexes which have an x-coordinate, a y-coordinate, and a z-coordinate. The z-axis goes from front to back. Zero is on the screen surface. So if you're sitting in front of a terminal, front pops out of the screen towards you, and back is going back into the virtual space behind the screen. To make an object appear to be going into the screen, you decrease its z value. A 2D scene, like this, can be created with OpenGL by always setting the z-coordinate to zero. Setting the triangle's three vertexes requires three GL vertex calls, and setting a color for each vertex requires three GL color calls. Drawing the triangle requires GL begin and GL end to group the vertexes. Creating a 3D pyramid would require three times as many GL vertex calls to define the three surfaces. To display an image instead of coloring the shape, you would use GL bind texture, and then you would use GL text cord calls instead of the GL color calls. And now we'll move on to Ruby Game, which is a full-feature, high-level game development library that also exposes its lower-level wrappers around SDLC API. You can jumpstart your project using Ruby Game's convenience methods and helper classes, but if necessary, you can access SDL functions through Ruby, Ruby Game on an a la carte basis to tweak your code. Ruby Game was initially modeled after Pygame, a popular Python-based framework, and its name reflects that. According to John Croissant, the creator of Py Ruby Game, he chose Pygame because it was the best development framework he knew about at the time. Over time, even the features that come closest to being direct ports from Pygame have become more distinctly Ruby-tinged in the way they're implemented. Ruby Game 3, the next major release of the framework, will be a radical departure from Pygame. John is working to ensure that older games will still run on the new system, though some adjustments may be required. Before I go into some of what's in store for Ruby Game 3, I want to give you a feel for what it means for a game engine to be Pygame-like by looking into some of the sample apps packaged with Ruby Game 2, the current version of Ruby Game. The Punch the Chimp game that resembles a banner ad is a direct port from a Pygame tutorial. The Ruby Game and Pygame APIs are similar enough that you can follow along in the Ruby Game code while going through a step-by-step Pygame tutorial. Before we see this game in action, I'm just going to substitute a picture of a gorilla for the original chimp because I just couldn't bring myself to smack a realistic-looking chimp. So first you move, the fist with the, you move the fist with the cursor, and then you throw your punch by clicking the mouse button. If you make contact, the chimp spins. Rect, as in rectangle, is one of the main classes in Pygame, and likewise one of the main classes in RubyGame2.x. Rects are typically paired with sprites, and are usually based on the dimensions of the image that the sprite represents. Here's the, here is the bitmap that represents the chimp in the game. Game frameworks typically allow the user to specify a color that should not be rendered when a particular image is displayed, in this case, fuchsia. With the background, without the background, the chimp cuts a fine figure in the app. Rest can be used to move sprites in Ruby game and Pi game. You can position a sprite by setting any of the attributes represented here by circles or dashed lines on the sprite's rec. The snippet in the red box is used to position the chimp when the punch the chimp game starts by assigning uh, coordinate values to top left. The rect class also provides collision detection services and a lot of utility methods like clamp, which puts a rect right inside another rect, and inflate, which can make the rect grow or shrink depending on whether you pass in positive or negative numbers. This is the code that determines whether the fist has made contact. The test is made with a smaller version of the fist rect, 
made by deflating it or inflating it with negative parameters to ensure that a punch only registers if the fist, if the fist hits its target squarely. Another utility class that's central to Pi game programming is the sprite group. And the group class in the sprite module is likewise important for Ruby games. Sprites, group ha sprites groups handle bulk actions for the constituent sprites, including drawing, updating, and collision detection. In this Ruby game sample app, which shows how to achieve a number of different effects with Ruby games, the pandas all belong to the same sprites group. Often in real games, the sprites don't belong to the same sprites group. You can organize games around sprites groups. Sprites groups are very easily extensible. You might have uh, different sprites groups for different teams, for example. When we looked at the Ruby SDL sample code, we saw that a simple, simple group updates can be achieved by putting all the sprites in an array and looping through that array to redraw each sprite each frame. So what makes sprites groups special? Well, one example of a useful feature which is available if you mix in Ruby games update group module or Pi games render update module is that they can keep track of the recs that were repositioned since the last update and only redisplay those. Now we'll look at some of what's going on in the development branch. One of the major changes is the new scene management system replete with type in, tight OpenGL integration, a new event management system, and a positioning system that's very different from the Pi game like, like rec based one. Here's a demo app from the Ruby Game 3 development branch. The big panda follows the mouse, and when you click on the screen, both the panda and the ruby jump to the cursor. When the panda and the ruby collide, they turn red. Here's the code that sets up the Ruby sprite in the new system. Behind the scenes, it's using the same sort of bulky sequence of OpenGL API calls we looked at in the, in the Rudel sample, but here they're wrapped with a single setup texture call. The depth variable enables the user to specify whether a particular sprite should be rendered closer to the front or closer to the back of the scene in relation to other sprites. The enhanced Ruby Game 3 sprite groups will be responsible for drawing the sprites in the proper order. The position is set using two coordinates, but behind the scenes, the framework is using OpenGL's 3D positioning system with the Z coordinate set to zero. There's tight OpenGL integration in the Ruby Game 3 branch, but John is committed to making the new system work without requiring a 3D graphics card. There will be an alternative implementation of the new scene management framework that will not require OpenGL. The Ruby Game Picture in a Picture may remind you of the radar screen we looked at in the Nebula Gauntlet app, but the implementations are entirely different. In Nebula or Gauntlet, the scaled-down version is achieved by drawing a small shape to represent each spaceship or shield. In this Ruby Game 3 demo app, the window in the upper right is showing another view of the scene by virtue of a virtual camera with a perspective that differs from the scene manager's default perspective. You can think of a software camera as being similar to a cell phone camera, and that both involve focusing on a region of the world. In the software realm, this is where the objects are positioned, and projecting it onto a two-dimensional screen. If the world region is defined to match the default camera's world region, but its screen region is smaller, as it is in this case, the figures appear to be diminished. There's no application code that draws a second panda or ruby, like the white circles had to be drawn uh, in the Nebula Gauntlet app. The second camera just needs to be added to the, to the scene using add camera. A release date for Ruby Game 3 has not been scheduled yet. There's still a lot of ideas that John would like to incorporate into it. He has ideas that push the envelope of game, game development that you can read about in comments in the Ruby game code and also on his blog. Here's a recent entry about why the RGB color model is inadequate for rendering a scene in the middle of a tunnel lit with yellow lights. He suggests that many developers would just tint everything in the scene yellow, but considers what it might be involved in making the scene more true to life. In real life, the limited spectrum emitted by the lights in the tunnel would make a red car appear to be dark yellow-orange or a blue car appear to be nearly black. And now we'll move on to Gosu. Gosu is polished and compact. Its development team aims to include everything you need to create a game, but nothing more. Every feature it supports was needed for and tested in an existing application. Nothing was added because someone thought it might be useful in theory. In keeping with the design rationale behind the code, Gosu is packaged with a well thought out tutorial that provides everything you need to get started with Gosu, but nothing more. Therefore, it takes less, th less than an hour to complete, but, but by the end of the hour, you're ready to start developing games. Here's what the finished tutorial looks like. When you steer the ship into a star, the star vanishes and you get points. It's not designed to be challenging. It was expressly designed as a teaching tool. Even experienced Gosu developers start out by subclassing Gosu's window class and taking advantage of its built-in services. Here's a skeletal main window. 
You don't need to start a main game loop or set up an event queue in your application code because Gosu handles that behind the scenes. Gosu will call the main Windows update method and then its draw method every frame. When the user presses a key on the keyboard or the mouse button, the button down callback is invoked. By the end of the tutorial, the main Windows update implementation calls methods on the spaceship and the stars to determine if and how they need to be repositioned or modified before the next time the screen is redisplayed and repositions them if necessary. Here's a quick look at how the stars are animated. Each star gets a random position and color when it's created. About 10 times a second, each star's image shifts to the next image in an image array created from the PNG file shown here. Because Gosu is so streamlined, developers have found that it's well suited for timed game development competitions. This game was created for a competition by a team of developers, including Gosu lead developer Julian Rushka and Florian Gross, who posted a link to it on the Ruby Talk mailing list. It was created in 72 hours. The version shown here was polished a little bit after the competition ended. The object of the game is to lure the sleepwalking witch back to bed, primarily using chocolate as bait. Um, when the little fairy clicks on the chocolate, the chocolate bar appears in her hands. And um, when she clicks on the ice cream cone and then clicks on the, the witch um, to feed her ice cream, um, she gets the power of being able to, to zap things with ice bolts. And if you feed her chili, she can then throw fire bolts. So she'll need a fire bolt in order to uh, melt that little ice block. Um, you try to shut off the lights because the lights might wake her up. So you can see there's a little light switch between the two areas of light. So what the fairy is going to try to do is get her to go down and shut off the light switch by scaring her with a spider so she'll go like this with her arms. And when she does that, she'll hit the light switch and the light will go off. So then she can continue on towards her bed, uh, which is what she's going to do here. I think she's gone past her last obstacle. So it's really cool what you can do just by being able to modify transparency of an image and modify its size. Part of the Gosu philosophy is that anything that's not essential to most, for most games should be added by integrating with additional libraries, not by being added to the Gosu source, to the Gosu base. Um, as part of a recent Gosu release, a tutorial that shows how Gosu could be integrated with the Chipmunk 2D physics library was added. Chipmunk is written in C, but is packaged with its own Ruby bindings. Chipmunk enables you to imbue your sprites with virtual maps so that you can apply virtual force to them. And when they collide, they behave according to the laws of natural physics. And here's a demo that's packaged with the chipmunk, the chipmunk distribution. The chipmunk tutorial uses the original Gosu tutorial we looked at a few minutes ago as a starting point. This code block shows how each star is linked to a body, which in turn is linked to a shape. A rigid body in chipmunk has physical properties like mass and velocity, while its shape represents an area on the screen. The shape associated with a sprite is inspected at collision time to see if it overlaps another entity's shape. The star's body is mapped to a chipmunk circle, so a collision will register if another entity moves between the points of the star without actually touching the star. It's possible to assign multiple shapes to a body. Assigning a triangle to each point of the star and a polygon to the middle of the star would make for a more precise game. There are numerous changes to the internals of the original Gosu tutorial in the chipmunk enhanced version, but when you run the application, it looks just like the original version. I think the most magical thing about chipmunk is watching the stylized sprites move in a natural way. So I modified Dirk's tutorial by commenting out the code that removes the stars when the spaceship steers into them. That way, you could see what happens when the spaceship hits the chipmunk enhanced stars. And I also add, added to the density of the stars and added a couple of chipmunk enhanced chipmunk logos. So this is the sort of thing that can happen when you mix Gosu and Chipmunk. Gosu was recently integrated with R Magic after users requested the ability to dynamically modify the landscape during a game. This sample app that's packaged with Gosu shows some of the special effects that were not possible without R Magic. R Magic is the Ruby bindings for the Image Magic libraries, which can be used to transform or combine images and apply dozens of special effects like mirroring, flipping even emulating a watermark or Polaroid into the camera. For comparison's sake, here are a couple of screenshots from a game packaged with Rudel. It's similar in that it involves blasting holes in a landscape. It features tanks instead of toy soldiers. The little square boxes are the tanks. The remove dirt method makes it look like dirt was displaced by rendering a black circle where the projectile drops. Of course, this only works with a black background. 
with image magic, with, uh, with image magic, there are no such restrictions. Our magic integration opens up so many possibilities. This slide and the next show the code that makes it look like craters with charred rims are left in the earth. In this code block, circle and fill create a black circle, and shadow creates a blurred version of that circle. When one of the soldiers shoots a star or the ground, the app looks through the image tiles that comprise the background and determine which ones were near the blast. It then uses the R Magic composite method, passing it via top flag to place a shadow on the tile image. Next, it uses disk out composite op flag, which adds the smaller, smoother crater image. The back flag indicates that a space, the, a space, the shape of the image should be erased in the composite image. The last line of code generates a ghost image based on that composite R magic image. The very latest release of Gosu features another variation on the tutorial. Gosu uses OpenGL for rendering behind the scenes. This latest version that was released just last week enables developers to access the OpenGL API directly from within Gosu's main window class by putting the GL calls in a block and passing it to the GL method. The new sample incorporates a 3D background. Most of the OpenGL API calls are encapsulated in the exec GL method, um, which is the last call in that block there. Um, and which I'll show you after we see the sample in action. The mountain range effect is created using the same texture over and over with a random height. Here's a fragment of the exact GL code. The GL text info method gives the GoSu application code access to the bound GL texture. The background is composed of multiple triangles which have vertexes in common. Instead of making a separate set of GL vertex calls for each surface, which, which, which would result in specifying the same vertex more than once, the GL triangle strip OpenGL API specifier is used. With GL triangle strip, you can declare three or more vertexes, and OpenGL takes care of connecting them with triangular surfaces. The sli this slide just shows one of the four vertexes defined in the application. The scrolling background is composed of multiple GL triangle strips. Given what it takes to hand code 3D background effects in a 2D environment, I'm sure you can imagine why people use 3D modeling software for more complex characters and scenes. Now we're going to talk about Ruby projects that leverage full-blown 3D modules. I'm sorry, full-blown 3D models. Ogre.rb, a 3D graphics rendering engine, and Shattered Ruby, a 3D game development framework that's built on top of Ogre.rb. Ogre.rb is a Ruby wrapper around Ogre, which stands for Object-Oriented Graphics Rendering Engine. It's used for combining 3D models, textures, and other kinds of graphical content into a scene. There are ways to incorporate special effects, including wind, rain, smoke, photorealistic explosions, and sophisticated lighting techniques. This is a screenshot from one of the sample scenes packaged with Ogre.rb. It's actually a Ruby port of one of the demos packaged with Ogre. The green Ogre head is an example of a 3D model. Using arrow keys or the mouse, you can navigate around the scene and view the ogre head from the side or from the back. The front is not just a facade. It's fully rendered in sharp detail, 360 degrees around. Ogre is written in C++, and Swig was used to help generate the C++ extension for Ruby. The ogre.rb developers would like to incorporate Ruby style to the greatest extent possible. They expect it to be a challenge because C++ best practices embraced by the Ogre team are very hard to translate into idiomatic Ruby without making the API unrecognizable to experienced Ogre users. Shattered Ruby is a 3D game development framework inspired by Ruby on Rails and built on top of Ogre. Here's a version of Tetris created with Shattered Ruby. It amazes me the extent to which Martin and Michael, the developers and creators of Shattered Ruby, find ways to talk about every aspect of 3D game development in terms of Ruby on Rails. For example, here are some quotes from a post to the Shattered Ruby forum in which Martin manages to liken Shattered to Rails, even as he's pointing out a way in which Rails and Shattered are not only different, but diametrically opposed. He points out that the model in Rails is more complex than the typical Shattered model, while the view in Shattered, a 3D view, is way more complex than the view in a Rails app. He concludes that Rails gets a lot of mileage out of being able to make assumptions about the model, while Shattered can do the same with its views. Shattered can reduce the amount of code needed to describe the scene considerably, 
by making assumptions about where the media files can be found in the application directory structure and what they're called, about how objects created from a view are likely to be grouped, and about the relationship between the view and the model. Here's a code snippet from one of the sample apps that comes with ogre.rg. The bottom block shows how the same seed could be rendered and shattered. But shattered is not only about reducing code size. It's also about having fun with the code you do write and being more expressive. Vectors are commonly, used, are commonly created by passing three coordinates to V. I like the way Shatter provides a core extension for the symbol for symbol to add two V support to symbols that describe change in direction, like forward and backwards. Timers are what make Shatter tick. Shatter makes it easy to set up timers. I went ahead and took these examples of, from of timers from the Shattered Wiki because I couldn't think of a better example of a timer demo class than a bomb that needs its fuse shortened every second until it blows up at the end of 30 seconds. Now let's back up and look at how a typical Shattered app is structured. You begin building a game by typing Shatter in the name of your game. And then Shatter generates this directory structure which should be familiar to most of you. Actors are made up of a model and a view. The model contains the game logic and the user input handlers. Methods on the model that are, often, that are also defined on the view will automatically get invoked on the view after they're invoked on the model. The game should have at least one state. You can generate a state using script generate. Ogre material scripts can be used to control textures, light settings, and positioning in 3D models. This is the format for material scripts as specified by the Ogre manuals. Um, sometimes it's, it's kind of a difficult format. It's kind of a, a pain to work with. But Shattered supplies a mechanism for using ERB to generate scripts with the Ogre materials format. Shortly after the latest version of the Tetris tutorial was posted on the Shattered Wiki last year, Martin and Michael began a major restructuring effort. One of the major goals was to get rid of the controller in favor of the application structure we looked at a few slides back. It used to be that an actor was paired with a model view, model view controller trio. The game logic lived in the model, the view was told when and what to display, and the controller handled user requests and was supposed to tap the model and the view as needed. Michael and Martin recognized that it was too easy to put certain kinds of logic in both the controller and the model. The other main goal was to make everything supported by ogre.rb available to shattered developers. When the framework was first written, only wrappers for the subset of Ogre features that were needed for, Shatter, for Shattered's game DSL were packaged with Shattered. On the Shattered blog, Michael explains this decision in terms of Ruby on Rails. He explains that Shatter and Ogre.rb are analogous to active record in Rails, just as Rails developers have the option of using straight SQL when there's no active record support for something they need to do. Shattered developers can use straight Ogre.rb calls when Shatter doesn't handle something out of the box. So I can't demo Tetris for you now. Eventually, the tutorial on the Shattered Wiki will be updated, and you'll be able to download it for yourself. So what can you do with Shattered now while you're waiting for the restructuring to be finished? Well, with the current downloadable version of Shattered um, and the somewhat dated tutorials on the Wiki, you can do a tutorial that ends up looking like this. I think the coding environment and the style is amazing. Um, but running the app, I have to say, isn't particularly satisfying. I mean, we saw this sort of thing with the OpenGL API. Um, I think 3D is most satisfying when you're working with more asymmetrical models. You can create these with modeling tools, and there's some open source ones. Um, there's a great one called Blender. And there are also hundreds of 3D models on the web that you can download for free. When I rotate these, it gives me the sensation of actually reaching into my laptop and spinning the objects around with my own hands. So I'm just going to show you a sample app that I made with the current version of Shattered because I thought maybe it will give you some ideas and it will show you something you can actually do today with the Shattered that's there now. Um, it shows you how you can, that you can move models and you can detect their position. Um, and there's really an incredible amount you can do with just that. So here's a really cool, I mainly wrote this to show this really cool B model that I found for free and downloaded. Um, and there's Roo. And what do you get when you combine Roo and a B? So you'll see when the app detects that the, um, the B is lined up with the Roo. See what happens. Don't miss it. So, but um, 
actually Michael and Martin are here at RubyCon. You want to? They're sitting right up here, so um, they could probably show you some really, really amazing chatter demos with stuff that hasn't been posted that's not in SVN yet. I know one of the things they've done is integrated sound into the <laughs> framework. And I said I wasn't going to talk about sound, but it's really cool what you can do with sound in 3D. Because with a, a 3D application, when something gets further into the distance, the sound actually gets quieter automatically. Um, so they've also integrated Shattered with Chipmunk. Um, and there's some videos on YouTube that you could see. If you, I'm not going to show the demos now, but you can look at um, Shattered and, and Chipmunk together on, um, on YouTube. And maybe my phone, Martin, will show you some other demos if you catch them sometime during the next couple of days. So. Um, as incredible as it may seem, there's actually another 3D framework in the works that also um, aims to provide a Rails-like development experience. Um, it's JRuby-based, and it wraps the JMonkey engine, a 3D game development framework written in Java. It's in its beginning stages, but I think it will be a really interesting project to watch. Um, its creator, David Coons, is here also. If you want to raise your hand. And uh, you can ask him to maybe do a demo for you. Um, he's also created a Rails-like framework for creating swing GUIs. So is Ruby a legitimate player in the gaming space? Um, I'd like to start off addressing this topic um, by telling you something that I think is both indicative of Ruby's rising, rising profile in the gaming space and something that has the potential to further improve Ruby's standing as a game programming language. And that is, the GGZ Gaming Zone has bolstered its support for Ruby. So what is the GGZ Gaming Zone? GGZ is a recursive acronym like NU. Actually, when GGZ was founded around eight years ago, it was initially called New Gaming Zone, or GGZ. The founders anticipated becoming part of the new project, but when they later decided against that, they decided to go with the name GGZ Gaming Zone. The GGZ Gaming Zone project has a lot of useful resources for game developers, including libraries that facilitate separating your game into client and server components, libraries and protocols for deploying your game over a network, and libraries that provide services ranging from sign-in to reserving seats to saving high scores. The GGZ source repository also contains dozens of games and a web portal designed for gaming communities complete with RESTful APIs for accessing information like tournament schedules and player rankings. The portal software is running on the GGZ community site, where you can also find tournament schedules. Spades is particularly pop popular. There are Spades tournaments on a regular basis. The top half of the screen shows the logon screen that pops up when you go to the GGZ community site and hit the Play Now button. You don't even need an account to play games that are installed there. You can just log on as guest. The bottom half of the split screen shows the logon screen that you'll see if you install GGZ software on your computer and run the core launching client. In this screen, um, you can choose the GGZ portal server, or you can choose a GGZ server that's on your own local machine, or maybe a GGZ server that's on your friend's machine, or any other number of public GGZ servers that are running all over the world. The GGZ core launching client, shown here as a GTK client, there's also a KDE client, and until recently, there was a GNOME client, but it got a little bit out of date. The author of GNOME Chess is currently working on a new GNOME launching client for GGZ. The core clients packaged with GGZ are basically chat clients that can launch games. The core client lists the games that are available for launching and provides information about the status of any virtual tables, like bridge tables, not database tables, where games are in progress and where people are waiting for additional players to show up. When you launch a multiplayer game, you're prompted to indicate which seats you would like to open to anyone, which seats should be reserved for particular players, and which should be assigned to the computer. You can join games as a player or a spectator. Here's a sampling of the games that are packaged with GGZ. GGZ game code is usually broken down into game server code and game client code. GGZ offers more than one client for several of the games. Three very different tic-tac-toe clients are on the bottom here. If there are multiple front ends available, the core launching client will prompt you to pick one. Here's an example of a game that is GGZ compliant but not packaged with GGZ. Iagno is part of the GNOME games package. All of the GNOME game packages have GGZ core launching clients built into them. This is the screen you'll see if you choose network game from the game menu shown. If you can choose a remote game server, and log on, then you can choose a remote game server and log on to play Iagno. There are several other games that are GGZ compliant but not packaged with GGZ. They're still hosted on GGZ's server. This is the architecture that makes it easy for GGZ to support multiple core clients, 
multiple game clients, and multiple game servers for the same game. GGZ publishes protocols for communication between clients and servers that define message types and describe the kinds of data that must accompany each message type. Here's a closer look at one of these protocols. These are the message types included in the communication protocol between the game client and the core launching client. Each message type is assigned a numeric ID as part of the protocol. The IDs are shown here in white. Game spectator seat is an example of the type of message a core client can send to a game client to indicate that a user wants to join the game as a spectator. The protocol specifies that the seat ID, an integer, and the player name, a string, must be sent with the game spectator seat message. For everything other than the communication between a game client and a game server, GGZ provides utility libraries that encapsulate both the GGZ-specific protocols and the network protocols used to send messages. These libraries are represented by highlighted green text in the diagram. Since each individual game has a different protocol for communication between the game client and the game server, GGZ can't offer a prepackaged library that will work for every game. But what it does offer instead is a flexible code generation utility called GGZ ConGen. You define your game protocol in XML format and specify your network protocol in a command line argument, and then the utility will generate a file that contains a method for each message type in your game protocol that uses the specified network protocol to send the appropriate data types over the network. The generated networking code is represented by the file name highlighted in orange. I call the generated files net.c in this diagram because net.c is the name of the file utility is the name of the file the utility generates when, for games written in C. And C is the primary development language for GGZ. But the code generator itself, which is highlighted in red, is written in Ruby. It's the only part of the GGZ infrastructure that's written in Ruby. Here's an example of an XML file that describes the tic-tac-toe game client server protocol. You can see that the game over message is given a numeric ID value of three, and that a single byte value called winner should be sent along with the message. Here's what the generated C code looks like. So now that I've talked about what GGZ is, I can explain how GGZ has been bolstered to support Ruby more. Just last week, Joseph Spillner, the GGZ lead developer, enhanced the code generation utility so that it now generates proper Ruby code. Here's the generated Ruby code for the same send game over method we just looked at in C. It gets a socket and sends the integer ID code for the game over message, as well as the winner name and byte format. Ruby bindings for the library that handles communication between the game server and the GGZ core server were recently added, as well as bindings for the library that handles communication between the game client and the core launching client. As a proof of concept, Joseph Spillner, the lead developer for GGZ, wrote a tic-tac-toe game called Ruby Toe in Ruby and a rudimentary client using QT Ruby. Here's a closer view of the QT Ruby client. As a proof of concept, the Ruby Toe server does not implement all the features of the C-based tic-tac-toe server that the, that the C-based tic-tac-toe server implements. But one feature it does support is a pluggable artificial intelligence module. It uses the same AI module as the C version by virtue of another C extension. This code fragment shows where Ruby Toe tries to load the AI module. If the AI module is not available, it just issues a warning that if the computer is one of the players, it's just going to make a random choice based on the available squares. This code block shows that if AI is available, its find move function will be called when it's the computer's turn. If not, the tic-tac-toe server will just choose a random number. Both the experimental Ruby client and the experimental Ruby server are pretty basic, but they signal the potential for a whole GGZ Ruby package. There's currently a GGZ Python package, which is tightly integrated with PyGame, GGZ developers are thinking about integration with the Ruby game programming framework, maybe one of the frameworks we just talked about this afternoon. So, is Ruby a legitimate player in the gaming space? In a way, I could have called this page, is Ruby a legitimate player in the gaming space, instead of resources. I think very definitely fun games can be created in Ruby, games that are fun to play. I guess one of the things that gives would-be game developers pause is Ruby's garbage collection policy. Everything stops during garbage collection. But that issue has certainly not stopped the developers of these frameworks in their tracks. One way to deal with this might be to just write the server portion of your game in Ruby, maybe using GGZ's libraries and protocols. Shattered addresses the problem by calling GC every frame. Julian Rushka, the lead developer for Gosu, recently tried modifying the library to call GC every 10 seconds 
but took out that code before the latest release because he didn't think it made a difference. He has worked on improving GOSU performance in the last few releases and is still working on it for the next release, but GC was not one of the issues he identified as major. And it also didn't stop a multimedia company from starting to use GOSU. The company is called Thinking Pictures, and that's my big news for the day. I can't say anyone's building a commercial video game with the Ruby game development framework, but I can say that a Ruby game development framework is being used commercially, which is a start. Thank you. Um, any questions? Look at this again. Oh yeah, yeah. I definitely well I'm probably um, chariotsolutions.com. Um probably by Monday should be there. Are there any uh, is there any potential for web based games with any of these things, like maybe the Java based one? Well, um like GGZ actually has Java Java you know Java a Java client and you know is integrated with Java. Um, yeah, as far as I mean, you know, it's it's interesting because um, you know probably you've heard of Lauren New, the um, the game that Michael Buffington wrote and created with Rails. It was like a big multiplayer web-based game that was actually used with Rails. I mean, people don't usually think of Rails as a game development framework. Um, and there's several you know Ajax-based games you know on the web. Um, there's um, as far as you know uh, networking the games. Um, the new Nebula Gauntlet right now only allows um, single, is, is only really um, moving forward in single development mode, but he started working on networking it and used um, Event Machine as um, sort of, uh, as for, for his networking, which just sort of allows you to send and receive, which allows you to sort of just worry about getting messages because Event Machine takes care of all the networking for you. I don't know if that's what you meant, or more specifically, something that looks like a, a web-based game that you play in a browser. Any others? Okay, thank you.